G'day. G'day and welcome to worship this week. As we gather together, hear the words of the psalmist from Psalm 25. For you, O Lord, I lift my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Let's come lifting our soul to the Lord as we sing together. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we do lift our soul to you. We sing praise to your name. We know that as we gather this day to worship you, there are parts of our heart and our soul that we try to keep hidden from you. For some of us, we hide from them ourselves. Thoughts and deeds that don't, do not reflect who you are and who you want us to be. Lord, we confess our failings, the brokenness of our love, the limitedness of our compassion and grace. Forgive us, we pray. Restore us as we worship you, as we seek to understand you more and serve your kingdom. So come, Holy God, by the power of your spirit, anoint each one of us this day and transform us, we pray, that we would become the children and the church you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The book of Judges, a number of stories about mostly men who are raised up to provide leadership and wisdom to the people of Israel. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 are dedicated to the story of Deborah. Deborah, a judge of the Lord, of the people of Israel, who was camped in the hills, to whom people went for wisdom, for judgment, for dispute settlement. This is the story of how God used a woman to bring hope and life to the community that was the people of Israel. It's a fascinating little story. And the first thing you have to do, deal with is that she was a woman and that any space in which you have a problem with women in leadership stumbles here at this point. We're only six books into the scriptures. We've had the first five books of the law, the story, ancient stories of God's call on the people, the freedom uh, 
from Egypt and the forming of the nation. And then we get this book. This collection of stories of the judges. And here is a woman who is providing leadership to the people of Israel, to the nation. Dispensing wisdom and binding judgments. And in the end, calling and leading an army. She calls Barak to calm and to raise up an army. And interestingly, he says, yeah, yeah, I know God is on you, but you need to come with us too. And so she says, all right, I'll be there. I'll be there. You're a bit scaredy poos, but I'll be there. And then interestingly, she says, but you will miss out on the honor of killing the enemy general. And we've got to understand, this is an ancient time with an ancient set of uh, priorities and codes of conduct. A time where the one who defeats the opposition general is deemed to be the greatest. And here, this man, this soldier, who was a little scaredy cat, he's told, well, you're not going to be the hero of this story. And so when he chases the enemy general, he finds that the enemy general has already been taken out of the picture by another woman. This is Deborah. This is the story of how God used a woman to bring peace to the nation for 40 years. It's a story of just doing what you need to do when God calls you to do it. It's a story of faithfulness. It's a story of not letting the status quo get in the way of you being faithful to God's call on your life. It's a story of facing fear, discrimination, social norms, and saying, no, there is a higher purpose. There is a higher calling, and that calling is God's will. Friends, it's only a little story. One chapter to tell the narrative of what happened and one chapter to sing the song of what happened. But it stands out from the crowd because of the key role of a lady like Deborah. Now, I've grown up in and around the church. And I have spent a lifetime in and around mostly churches that are quite affirming of women in leadership. But again, in my gain, in my journey, I encounter people who really struggle to allow a lady, a female, a woman to be in leadership. Friends, if that is your struggle, then stop thinking about it culturally Start thinking about it biblically. Because right back at the very beginning, six chapter, six books in, fourth chapter, Judges, don't mess with Deb. Because Deborah was a woman of God. Let's pray. Loving Father God, for many of us it just seems incredible that in any space, a person's gender or race could be a counter for or against them living out the mission that you have equipped them for. But we know we live in times where all sorts of barriers exist. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would tear down those barriers, that you would create your kingdom here where all people are honoured, where all are given the chance to shine with the gifts and the skills that you have placed within them. Because we know that all people matter to you. 
And so it is, Lord God, that we do pray for all people. For all those who are battling this day, struggling with health issues, body, mind, soul. Struggling with grief, loneliness. Struggling with a lack of food, water, shelter, clothes. Struggling with a sense of purpose. Lord, we pray that by your sovereign power, all needs would be met, all people would be set free, and that all people would be able to blossom with the goodness you have placed within them, the beauty that you have created in each one of us. So come, Holy God, pour out your love and power on the world. Transform our world and our living. This we pray in Jesus' name as we dedicate ourselves and our gifts to your service. Amen. Let's sing. Matthew 25, a parable of Jesus. Let's hear it. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, 
I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Often, when we read this passage, the narrative we hear is if we do not use our talents to please God, we will be punished. And there is an element or a sentiment of that echoing in this. But that is not the totality of this story. For we need to remember a number of key things. To start with, when it talks about the one cast out and abandoned, Jesus is the one that is about to be cast out and abandoned by the religious hierarchy. He is the one that is going to experience the kind of struggle and pain that equates with the gnashing of teeth. And that is God's journey. Because Jesus was faithful to God, not to the temple. And this is part of a larger narrative. As I spoke about last week, this passage sits within these few chapters of Jesus wrestling with the temple officials, of Jesus battling with those who have taken control of the faith of the people and turned it from freedom to a burden. This is part of a larger narrative that is saying to the religious elite, you, you who should have been the bearers and sharers of God's good news, have wasted that. And this is part of the description of the kingdom of God. For the beginning of this passage says, Again, it will be like. Again? Like? The previous passage opened with these words. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like. So again, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. This interesting story of a man who gives to his servants varying amounts, entrusts it with them, goes away and upon return calls them to account. And on some there is affirmation and on, their, on others there is not. So here is the question. What were the talents that the religious leaders had been given? If this is a message for them, 
What were the talents they had been given? And needed to care for. Let me suggest, and I thank uh, N.T. Wright, the past Bishop of Durham, for these thoughts. That some of the talents that they had were things like the law. They had been entrusted with the law of God. God's word to them. And instead of allowing it to free people to to multiply across the, the, the world, they had used it as a rod upon people's backs to control and corral. They've been given the prophets, that voice that came again and again and again to call people to faith. They had those words that called people to radical faith, to the Pursuit of mercy and justice. They had the temple. And they had the land. And they had the promises of God. Which included the declaration that the people of Israel were to be a light for the world. And so they take these talents, these gifts of God, and they misuse them. They circle the wagons rather than going out. Think about it for a moment. The leadership of the temple uses the uniqueness of the people of Israel to build a fence. A cultural fence that says, we are the precious ones and you are not. It's not very lighthousey, is it? It's not very sharing God's good news to others. The scriptures, these, the law that was so much about finding freedom, finding a place as God's children. Become rule and regulation. And indeed, their role as shepherds, ones who would work hard for the good of all people, seems to have been turned into the role of kings, ones who sit in the temple pontificating and living luxuriously off the people. This was their failure. Their failure was a failure to be wise. A failure to risk the ways of God. A failure to be faithful and faith-filled. This was their failure. It was that they became a static Kingdom building, earth bound people rather than servants of God. And so Jesus is saying to them, having already pointed out, they failed to recognize that the day of the Lord is near, that they have failed to recognize God's anointed one within them and respond appropriately. He is saying, you have been blessed. And what are you done with it? You stuck it in a hole in the ground. Rather than being excited about the possibilities of what you could do for the master, you've lived in fear. A fear that you have created in your own minds. And so the call to them was to risk, to live faithfully, to be who they were supposed to be, and to not get anchored 
in the agendas of the world. Friends, I want to suggest this to us today. That for us, the word is very similar. We, we are able, in the power of God, through the risen Christ and the Holy Spirit, to be beacons of light and hope in our world. We have been given all sorts of talents. The risen Jesus, the Holy Spirit, a personal relationship with a loving God, a spirit that gives power and wisdom, guidance and healing. We've been given the scriptures. We've been given the wisdom of the church, 2,000 years of stumbling, distilled witness to what it is to be a living body in the world. And we have been given freedom, the freedom to choose, the freedom of not being tied to things like the temple and the land, for we have been dispersed across the earth. Invited, though, to love the land we're in. Invited to love the people we're in. For we hear the echoes from the prophets who said to the people when they were in exile, don't just dream of going home. Put your roots down here. Make a difference here. We have that opportunity. That is a talent that is given to us. And so the call for us is be faithful in that. Take risks in that. Live faithfully faith-filled. For many of us, we live with great personal freedoms, great potential to connect with others. Don't waste it. For as the people of Israel turned in on themselves and tried to make themselves a holy people to the exclusion of others, so again and again in the history of the church, the church has turned in on itself to try and make itself a holy club. And that is not the witness of Christ. The witness of Jesus is the cross, sacrifice, reaching out to the world, giving of who we are, risking the relationships we build with people who might hurt us for the cause of the kingdom. So friends, as you reflect on this passage, you might hear its narrow reading of judgment and a God who's looking to make gains at our expense. But if you do, I believe you're hearing a very poor reading. And that rather we should be hearing that we have been richly blessed, richly gifted, richly entrusted with talents. We need to use them. So our buildings are not to be buildings that are done up and preserved for historical purposes but buildings that are used, whose doors are flung open to the community and its needs. I loved going into uh, a church in, in Scotland, big old building, and yet inside, they'd gutted it, they'd done all sorts of things, they'd put a second tier in with you know, newfangled glass and steel and, and uh, veneer boarding and, and all sorts of stuff, and they'd done it with a bit of class. But they had fundamentally ordered that church so that it was relevant, so that it could do the job it was supposed to do as a building for the church to use. I weep sometimes at the churches who just want to pay their minister so their minister will preach for them and visit them 
and have no interest in releasing their ministers, releasing their eldership to go out into the world and make a difference. Friends, if we spend our time looking inward about what makes us feel good and what comforts us in our faith journey, then we will fail to use our talents to the glory of God. So friends, be generous, be adventurous, be faithful and faith-filled, be spirit-empowered, take risks, share, share what you have, and at all times, do all that you do in the presence of the Holy Spirit and in the way of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we, we are the church, the body of Christ, gifted, talented. And Jesus calls us to live in his way. Let us not in any way, shape or form become as the Pharisees did, filled with religious piety and a lack of compassion for the rest of the world. To God be your glory, honour and praise. Amen. Love you, Father God. We hear the words of the parable. We hear the challenge to make use of what we have, to take risks in the wisdom of your spirit and the cause of your kingdom. Free us from fear and timidity, we pray. Give us boldness and courage as we seek to be that light on the hill that salty salt, that water in a dry land for all who are searching and in need. Come, Holy God. Use us in your service, we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.
to go. Unlike this story, the Lord Jesus has not gone away, but is present with us. His spirit is upon us. And we are called to be faithful. So go and be the church, the people of God, this day, for the good of all who live. In Jesus' name, Amen. Keeping my eyes on you, keeping my eyes on what you do. Bye.